So here we are, we're at Malibu Lagoon. So um, the first time we come to a site, we should get a sense of what the lay of the land is. And again, you guys are welcome to spread out. If you guys, I can scoot over if you guys want to, you know, scoot a little bit closer and, and still maintain our 10 foot buffer. Um, but okay, so um, when we first come to a site, we want to get a sense of, of what it looks like right now. And then also maybe what it was like recently. So let's talk about what's going on here right now. So we are in the Malibu Creek watershed. That is a year round, or we might call it perennial water source that's flowing from the San Fernando Valley down to, uh, down to the, the, the coast here. Um, now the catchment doesn't necessarily include all the San Fernando Valley historically, but we have Tapia water treatment facility. So did anybody drive down Las Virginis Road, Malibu Canyon Road? Okay, so if you guys took that way to get here, you drove past the Tapia water treatment facility. It's a regular, um, why do I keep touching my face? This is totally illegal. This is not the safe way to do so. Um, so it's, it's a regular uh, sewage treatment plant basically, um, but it handles much of the waste from the San Fernando Valley. So we get more, so the watershed in effect is larger here now than it was say 50 years ago, 100 years ago, etc. cetera. So water, so now this is a Southern California stream. So even though it was year round water always, the flow went like this, rainy time, rainy time, rainy time, summertime, 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 right? So it was very seasonal, had a strong seasonal component to it. One of the first things that happened, uh, you know, 60s, 70s, as Tapia was really coming online and the San Fernando Valley was really growing, lots of water were, was, was going into this facility and therefore lots of water was being discharged into Malibu, into the Malibu Creek watershed into the in Malibu Creek. So we went from a this system, uh, 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 to more like this. Uh, and so a continuous, uh, uh, input of water, fresh water into the system. Okay, why is that important? That's important because our Southern California coastal wetlands in particular are very much so a seasonal or, or have evolved in a seasonal hydrological setting. We're in a Mediterranean ecosystem, right? Yeah. Oh, great question. So the question is now are we continuous? And I'll tell you about now, but, but I'm, I'm describing right now the situation in 1980. So, so I'm setting up, I'm setting up the issue. It's actually gotten better is a short answer. So, so, so we return closer to what it historically was now. Um, but okay. So anyway, so we're in the, we're in the seventies and eighties, right? And so we have this high, this, this constant flow. This area here is, uh, a coastal salt marsh right? And so what's going on here is this water is coming down and it's hitting the ocean. We also have offshore, for those of you that have taken Dr. Patch's physical oceanography class, we also have this so-called longshore drift or, 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 or current going, going from essentially our, my, going from, as we look this way, going from our right to our left. So we have this movement of water, this net movement of water and sediment down the coast. So what that means is with our littoral cells, with our sediment cells, our sand movement up and down the coast, sand here is generally going from, from this side to this side, okay? And this is throughout all of our, all the Southern California Bight, actually all of California, but whatever. For now we're talking about the Southern California Bight. So what's happening is we have water squirching in towards the ocean, and then we have the ocean going this way. So every single time you look at an aerial image of a healthy, well-functioning coastal salt marsh in, in definitely in California, especially so, coastal Southern California, the wet the water body looks like the letter L. Okay, so we have, and that, that could be either a creek or it could be a lagoon like here, whatever, but we have water that's, you know, the top of the L and then it cruises over to the right. That's because that sand, those, that sediment is, is going is going down coast, it's going towards San Diego. And so in effect, the sand is kind of moving and cutting off the mouth. So historically, the water came down the letter L, well for you guys, came down the letter L, 
and then went to the right and then connects with the ocean down there. So we have essentially a sand spit, right? When I, when I was, when I was young and started working on wetlands, my background is as a marine biologist. I had not, I had not studied a lot of wetlands before graduate school. So when I started looking at these systems, I was saying, oh my God, these systems are all screwed up, right? Why are they screwed up? Because the water comes out of the creek and instead of going to the ocean, it kind of scoots off to the right. That is actually a healthy thing. So my impression was incorrect. My, my initial impression was incorrect. So if we look at a healthy system, that's what we'll see. What happened starting in the 50s, many people are, uh, let's see, how do I say this? So engineers, so we're in this era of everybody trying to screw with nature in this era of everybody knowing better than nature. And uh, the idea there was we want to get water is dangerous. Water floods, as we saw in class, right? Water can kill people. Water can cause damage. It's uncontrollable. It's a massive force. So the general approach has been get wa move, make water go away as fast as we possibly can. That's why we have the LA River, which is now mostly a concrete channel, right? The idea is get the water off the streets, off the streets, into the channel, into the channel, into the ocean as fast as possible. And so when it came to these types of situations, oftentimes one of the things we did uh, was to punch a hole straight at the bottom of the river. So instead of making an L, we started making wet or, or encouraging the wetlands to be more like a letter I, like a, you know, just, just, a, just or, or a lowercase L, right? Just a straight line. That is the aberrant condition. So the stuff that I was seeing when I was younger, I thought that was quote unquote healthy. That was aberrant. So this is healthy with a, 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 a sandy, you know, elevated block between the water and the ocean. Okay, if we have a lot of water flowing all the time, continuously, that'll tend to act to pop a hole in the connection between the wetland and the ocean. Given that this is historically a Mediterranean ecosystem, that would happen, but that would happen in the winter time when we had heavy storms, heavy flow, really intense downpours, that kind of stuff. The cork, if you will, pops open and then, and then essentially the water can flow into the ocean, the ocean water can flow in here, etc. But for most of the year, let's take summertime, the classic time that we're, uh, I mean, we're now to fall, but, but you know, just a few weeks ago we're in summer. What's going to happen is we have a little bit of flow or in some systems, no flow. In this system, we always have at least a little bit of flow. So the water is coming in, but it's not a huge amount. It's hot. It's, um, it, it's, you know, summertime. And so what happens is we have this water coming in here. The mouth is closed. The water starts to fill up. Yeah. So the water starts to fill up. So we create an impounded situation. One of, well, um, uh, yeah. And then I'll just say, because that water tends to be relatively still, we don't have a river flowing in a river flowing out. It tends to heat up because the sun hits it. So it gets warm. And if any salt at all comes over the top, either, either salt water comes percolates through the berm, or if we just have waves that break over and bring some salt water in, even just a little bit, the area will tend to become hyper saline over the course of the summer. It'll tend to become salt, even though it's fresh water coming in, it'll tend to get salty. And in some of our extreme cases, it can get super salty and much saltier than the ocean. Why? Because if we have this salt water connectivity, heat, hot, hitting it, the water molecules evaporate off, salt is left behind. So it gets a little bit saltier today. And then the same thing happens tomorrow. It gets a little teeny bit saltier tomorrow and tomorrow. So what we set up is our coastal salt marshes in Southern California tend to be very extreme. They tend to have extreme salinity. So sometimes of the year, they're totally fresh. Other times of the year, they might be saltier than the ocean. Winter time might be getting cold, clear creek water, so it might be cold. Middle of summer, it might be super, super hot, right? And so, so this notion of these extremes, is that's a key aspect of the ecology of these systems. Extremes in terms of water level, Right? So we talk about wetlands being, you know, the water is sort of changing. So we could be underwater or in the air. We could be salty. We could be fresh. We could be cold. We could be hot and all the associated things. As a consequence, the critters that can live here have specific adaptations. So 
So very specific um, uh, physiological mechanisms, specific behavioral mechanisms to deal with some of these crazy extremes. Just about everything that lives here can live somewhere else. <clears throat> Let's take the example of some of our plants. We have salt marsh plants here. Every single salt marsh plant can live up there on land. It generally speaking does not. But if we want to grow our wetland plants and we'd say, we say we take some of these seeds and take them back to school and put them in the greenhouse and want to grow up some baby plants or some seeds or something for a restoration, we water them with fresh water because they do really well. But, but they're able to persist here because they can grow in fresh water or salt water or brackish water, right? Brackish is not, not salt, not fresh, kind of in between. So they can grow in this environment. The trees behind you, the sycamores, cannot. The sycamores have to have fresh water. So in a sense, these wetland systems, these salt marsh systems, are a bit of a refuge. So these plants that would be outcompeted by the sycamores or these other terrestrial uh, uh, species, they, they have behavioral or physiological adaptations to be able to withstand this stressful environment and, and persist. Um, nevertheless, because it is so stressful, it does come with an energetic cost to live here relative to other sites, okay? So, stressful area. As a consequence, we have some critters that uh, live in these systems. Our, our coastal wetlands in California were never as extensive as they were on the East Coast West uh, uh, Gulf Coast stuff like that, right? There are always we have a very geologically young coast, so there are always little 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 dollops here and there, right? They were rarely like for miles and miles and miles and miles and miles and miles. So we started off with a relatively uh, 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 distinct, relatively fragmented group of wetlands in, in this area, and then we humans over the last 150 years have just screwed that up even more. So we fragmented it even more. We've We've made even fewer of them, fewer of them, etc. So because of that, because these guys have uh, unique physiological adaptations and stuff, because there weren't wetlands just everywhere up and down the coast, many of the residents that are, are either obligate or facultative users of these systems have become increasingly rare. And some of them have become threatened or endangered, and that's another key management overlay here. Tidewater goby would be the classic Southern California uh, endangered species, uh, a salt marsh endangered species. So tidewater goby lives in these areas. Locally, it can be a very abundant. So if we come out here, we're doing a new class in the in the spring where, where Dr. where Brenton is going to be showing you guys how to do staining and collecting of endangered species and stuff. So if we come out here and you and you take that one unit class with him, uh, it's it's uh, you might get hundreds. You know, in one net toe, you might get hundreds and hundreds of Tidewater gobies. You're like, dude, these guys are cool, right? They're abundant, but they're not everywhere at that density. So they wink on and they tend to wink on and wink off. So even though they might be locally abundant, they are not in every single wetland. They are not in every single watershed. So, so part of the management story here is dealing with the endangered species. Okay, so that's a bit about this, about the, the ecology here. As we've talked about, there's zonation here, right? So we have a certain vegetation up high. We start to go lower a little bit, a, a band of different plants, a little bit lower, a different band of plants, a little bit lower, mud flat, a little bit lower, standing water, that kind of thing. Yeah? Okay. So we can clearly see that zonation really clearly. You can also see the zonation going from the freshwater world to the saltwater world, but it's not as, it's harder to see. It's harder to see, and it's better to see from the air and stuff. But the easiest thing to see in our coastal salt marshes here, like in Malibu, is elevational zonation, right? Just like we talked about with the intertidal, rock intertidal, and all that kind of stuff. Okay, cool. All right, that, that's a bit of our setting here. Next, let's talk about the human setting right now, what we have. So, in addition to tapia changing the hydrology that's come, that was coming in here, uh, well, I'll, return, I'll return to the tapia story later. But, um, so, okay, so, so uh, we have... The, P, the human overlay. The quick 30 second version history of Malibu is this was an area that was hard to settle, right? So we have the you know, city of Los Angeles down over there. We have the Oxnard Plain in Ventura up there. Wasn't a whole lot of stuff in between here. This was uh, uh, a few ranchos, uh, 
uh, uh, Rancheros, but but it um, uh, not not a whole lot was happening for a long time. Very mountainy. People were doing grazing and things like that, but there wasn't a huge population. Then a proposal came to put a rail line to try to connect us up to, to you know Ventura and and uh, the greater LA area. Uh, the person that owned it at the time uh, didn't want didn't want a railroad, but because of the laws, if a railroad didn't exist and, and the government deemed that a railroad would be helpful for commerce or or transportation, whatever, they could just take the land by eminent domain. So the family ends up putting in a railroad just to sort of so they could control it. And they're like, what are people going to do? And so they started putting in bungalows, and I think it was the 1920s. Right? What's a bungalow? A bungalow is a place where people can go live at or near the beach, right? This was the country back then. That's what started the, the modern history of Malibu. So then like some Hollywood starlets and folks are like, hey, this is a cool place. I'm gonna go hang out here. Then that began the development of Malibu, uh, of, of what we now consider the, the, the Malibu coast or the city of Malibu. Because it had that history of development though, Many of the things we typically associate with a modern city were lacking for a long period of time. Chief among them, for our conversation, septic system. So most of all these gazillion million dollar mansions you see in Malibu, they all have a septic system. And so that can cause issues, okay? Uh, uh, Okay, I'll come back to that. Okay, so, wait, so uh, then we have the development, right? So there's the outright development. So this, this, this coastal, the water here, and when it was flooding, used to be able to go back farther off, the, off this away, right? Now we're pretty much constrained to the main channel, and we have this little outpocketing where we're sitting right here, right? But, but uh, uh, so we first started to fill that in, right? So we put where the, where the movie theater is now, and the coffee shop, and that stuff, that goes in, right? Pacific Coast Highway goes in, we have to put a bridge across the waterway, right? So we start to constrain the, 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 the width of the channel and stuff there. And then all these houses start to go in. This is called Malibu Colony. Again, septic system. You and I are sitting here, there's water right there, a sand, a basically sand dune and then the ocean. So people put these houses right on these sand dunes. The other thing to say is these are not random people living here. I, I'm just gonna make a guess that none of you guys live here. It's, it's just, it's a wild guess, it's a wild guess. There were the Michael Landons from Little House on the Prairie. There's the Pamela Andersons. There's all these very wealthy, very, um, we might say powerful folks that live here, right? So it's not just that we have development here and not just that we have the traditional human pressures. We have folks that have a strong finger on the pulse of the decision makers, right? So you cannot underestimate um, uh, uh, the importance of not just people, but people with a lot of influence on these resource management issues. Okay. When we start, when, when this area starts to get destroyed, when we actively start to, de to destroy this part of this wetland, this is in the 50s. What should we do? Hey, let's make it a dump, right? Again, wetlands, people hate wetlands. They smell, they're, they're they're, they're seen as wasted land. So over there, we start dumping stuff, refrigerators, all that kind of stuff. And then it becomes this sort of nasty, skanky dump. And then people say like, well, what the hell are we gonna do with that? And the answer is, ah, baseball. Yes, of course, baseball. So then we, we dump a bunch of dirt on that, drive over it, and turn it into a, ba a baseball field, right? Because we need more baseball fields in the world. I say every wetland I've worked on in the US Baseball fields are a factor. People desperately want to have little, uh, on our site in um, Louisiana, it was recently threatened by people wanting to put a big giant softball complex on there. Like, what the hell? Anyway, I mean, I like sports and all, but you know, really? So anyway, so then this was a baseball field. Okay, so then uh, people realized, hey, this maybe isn't a great idea. So the first uh, modern restoration that happened happens in the 70s. And essentially what it is is, removing the baseball and this is over here to as, as the camera's looking this is this is the area over over here the area over here over there and so um we we uh first rip that stuff out and then we decide hey we're gonna well let's do something 
they were biologists that designed this. And as a biologist, love my biologist, but they were not hydrologists. This was, again, 1970s. The science of re wetland restoration was more or less non existent, right? So they asked somebody like me, what do you want? And they, they essentially said, uh, I want some water. Okay, cool. So they went into here and they carved out three channels, what we call channel A, channel B, and channel C, which you cannot see because they do not exist anymore. Uh, on our Malibu trip module, I put some documents. In those documents, they, they reference these. And I've also put a couple pictures and you can see one of the, one of the, one of the um, uh, planning uh, documents that shows these channels. So essentially we made a, a channel here, then there was some uh, an island, and there was a channel over there, then another island, and then a third channel. So just like you had three fingers. In the back, it was standing water. So in theory, when the water was high, there was all this water. Why, let me ask you this, why, why, might, why might we, they have put islands there? And in the current, in the current iteration, there's an island in the middle. Why might we want islands in a wetland restoration? Okay, good. Yes. So, so the conceptual idea there is for um, dealing with predators primarily. So the idea is if we have some shorebirds out here that might be vulnerable to cats, uh, dogs, uh, uh, coyotes, stuff like that, right? The idea is if we can, we can isolate them from the mainland, maybe they have some degree of protection from nest predators. In reality, in a place like this, it doesn't matter because it's, it's hardly any distance. And, you know, if a cat really wants to get out there, it's getting out there. But, th but that's the idea. The idea is to try to create some kind of refuge from predators, right? So we did that. So we had these islands. And then immediately, almost immediately, stuff went, went bad.